All right, good morning, everyone. Um, hi, good to see everyone again. Um, so I thought we would continue this week in our topic of rebels, warriors, and kings, examining controversial leaders in Tanakh. And episode three, we're going to talk a little bit about Shlomo HaMelech. Um, so Shlomo HaMelech, I think, is a very interesting um, character. On one end, I think this is a case where I remember learning in school that Shlomo was the highlight of Jewish history, right? He builds the Beit HaMikdash. Um, at his point, he has people coming from all over the world to come and visit him, to come and have state visits like Malkat Shva and lots of other foreign dignities. This is maybe the high point of Jewish history. Um, there's peace and prosperity for everyone. Um, we'll see it's even described a little bit like a utopian society, um, parallels with different Nebuot that we see of what society is supposed to be like in Yemot HaMashiach. And this is really the high point. I remember it always confused me learning it because as you read, continue reading in the story of Shlomo, as much as it's just this high point and this you know, apex of, of, of Jewish history, what happens at the end? Uh, it all, right, it all falls apart, right? We know Shlomo takes on many other wives. We know that there are a lot of other sins um, that happen. Um, here, just pass the pipe. Well, tomorrow's over here. Um, and many other sins that happen, and his kingdom basically falls apart, where God even ends up telling him, you know, I'm not going to take it away from, you know, uh, it's not going to happen in your lifetime, but the kingdom eventually will be split in two, and we see how everything kind of falls apart. So, what I'm wondering is, how does this happen? How can we have this high point of Jewish history where everything is going so well for Shlomo, but at the same time, it has this terrible, um, failed ending? How, does this, how do these two sides work together? What we'll see in the Psukim, what we'll see as we outline the different stories of Shlomo Hamela, is that it's really painted as a very stark difference. And we'll see this kind of, we're going to look at a chart that kind of outlines Shlomo's, um, Shlomo's reign. At the very beginning, just like when we look at it together, um, it seems that things are kind of very, very good. Things seem to be excellent. Kind of parrot gimel is everything is going well. Shlomo's getting the Ruah from Hashem. He's building the base of Mikdash. Everything's awesome. Um, then when you get to Parag Yudalif, which is kind of on the flip side at the end, we see that everything is falling apart. Shlomo has, well, has many, many wives. He is building Bamot for Abu Zara in, in Eretz Israel, and everything has fallen apart. So we, we're, we're shown these two very stark, stark differences of kind of like the beginning of the story, great, everything's amazing, everything's awesome, and by the time you get to the end, everything is kind of a total failure. Um, and this, I think, is also confusing to a lot of biblical scholars, a lot of Parshanim, how exactly do we fit these two sides of the story together? Do we see this as, and we're going to analyze this together as a group, is it that things really were amazing at the beginning and Shlomo was doing everything correctly? And then does something happen that almost, you know, starts the, starts the decline? Everything really was um, great and going well at the beginning, and then at the end, something happens that we have to figure out that leads to kind of Shlomo's reign fall, completely falling apart. Um, or is it perhaps a little bit more nuanced? Um, is it that perhaps, you know, even these beginning stories, which are painted in a very positive way, can we look at them in a, you know, with a more analytical way and, and see, even when things we thought at first glance were very positive, maybe there already were kind of the seeds of failure already there, which seems to be kind of, I think, a theme in a lot of we've been discussing in the past week, right, with David and even a little bit with Elisha, um, that can we see the seeds of, of failure kind of earlier? And um, then the question that we'll have to discuss, is it that, you know, really it still was something positive Shlomo was doing? Like it was fine, but there was, there was danger there. And then unfortunately the danger got out of hand. Um, or is it that something maybe a little bit more complex, that these are not um, contradictory, but everyone, you know, has good sides to them and bad sides to them. And maybe Shlomo's reign also was a mixture of both. I mean, even at the beginning, some of these things that looked to be positive weren't exactly positive. And what we'll see as we go through this is it really seems to be this very, very stark difference. Um, academic Bible scholars actually, um, you know, or biblical critics will even say perhaps, you know, Parag you know, must be a different source, must be a different author, because it can't be that you have such a stark difference between something so positive and so negative. Um, so obviously we're going to view this as one, one unit, and we're going to try to look at it and know that really, even though it's a stark difference, it doesn't mean that those are alternate sources, this is still one source, um, but again, it begs that question of what happened? Were things really very good, then they became very bad, or is it a little bit more complicated? So that's what we're going to try to do today. Um, so the outline, what we'll do is we'll have a chance to, there's an ambitious goal, I think we're going to be able to do it. We'll look at kind of an overview of the narrative of Shlomo, the different stories that are happening. Then as a group, what we're going to do is we're going to go through kind of the major events of Shlomo's reign, especially the ones that are viewed as more positive. 
um, at least at the beginning. And we'll have to decide as a group, we're going to try to give Shlomo a grade, basically, for each of those incidents. So we'll go through and decide for each of those things as they happen, were these 100% positive, does he pass? Or do we think that even, even this thing that we might have thought if we learned when we were, you know, at an earlier time, this seemed to be something more positive, perhaps really, when we think about it again, this story is not really so positive about Shlomo. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do as we go through those different, those different accounts and then try to just come up with what's the lesson, obviously, for us today in society when we think about leadership, when we think about power, um, what exactly, what lessons can come out of that story. So that's basically what we're going to do. To start off, I wanted to go through a little bit of the, just to give us a, a review, a little bit of what happens in Sikurei Shlomo, with the stories of Shlomo. So you go to the first page, and I just put it on the board to give us a little bit of a better sense over here. We have kind of a chart here of basically what's going on in the time period of Shlomo. Um, so first of all, again, as usual, most of these ideas are taken from a lot of different articles. Um, this chart is adapted a little bit of a chart by Rabbi Alex Israel, who has an excellent, excellent book on Sefer Melachim. It's Melachim Alex, it's called, I think, you know, Kings Torn, torn uh, Into Two. It's a great book. I really highly recommend it. And at the end of um, my source packet, I gave you, again, just some further reading. If there's some different articles, if you want to look at that can shed more light kind of on the story. I think it's really fascinating topic that I've been bothered by, by for a very long time. And how, how do we kind of come to terms with these two different pictures that we have of Shlomo Hamel. So, if you look at this chart over here, just to kind of overview what happens, um, we start off with the rise of an empire. Parakimo, Shlomo marries Bat Paro. God appears to Shlomo and Gibbon. There's a very famous scene where Shlomo asks for wisdom, which we'll have a chance to analyze um, a little bit later on today. Um, Shlomo basically puts together his cabinet, organizes all the nations into 12, uh, 12 districts. Parakei describes to us Shlomo's power, his wealth, his wisdom. He starts to have to form international relationships with um, with Sor, right, with um, Phoenicia up north. Um, which is basically Lebanon, we see um, forced labor and taxation, which is going to be a theme that's kind of hidden there, but when you look at it a little more deeply, it comes up again and again that Shlomo has a lot of ambitious building projects, but building projects require what? Money and manpower. And so we're going to have to think about a little bit where is that money and manpower coming from, and are we comfortable with that? Um, then it moves on to the middle section. Here we have kind of like the, the highlight for the construction of the base of Mikdash, which even within the construction of the Beit HaMikdash, we see different steps, right? Whether it's building the Beit HaMikdash, then it kind of breaks in Perak Zion, and we're told that not about the Beit HaMikdash, but one of Shlomo's other major building projects is what? His own palace, right? His own building. So he breaks yeah. and talks about that. Then it goes back to the to the um, Kalim of the Beit HaMikdash. And then finally, there's a very famous scene of dedicating the Beit HaMikdash. Shlomo has a very powerful tefillah, and he shares that he wants the Beit HaMikdash to be a place that all nations can come and pray. But again, we see, I think, just especially if we're already just being nuanced at things, that even the kind of, uh, you know, chiastic structure here of building up, the, the highlight in the middle seems to be what, right? His palace, right? Just something to think about, even though it is framed by very powerful descriptions of the Beit HaMikdash. Um, and then we get to kind of scroll down a little bit, Parak Tech, and this is where um, the question um, becomes over here of what happens at the end. Um, so in Parak Tech, God appears to Shlomo again, almost paralleling what we saw earlier in Gibbon. Um, Parak Tech and Yud talk about all the power, wealth, and wisdom of Shlomo Hamel. People are coming to talk to him from all over. Um, Malkashva, right, comes, Queen of Sheba comes to ask him questions, to talk to him about things like that. Parak Yudalab is our downfall, like explicit downfall Parak. Shlomo's marrying multiple wives. They're bringing a Buddha Zara instead of the land. God rebukes Shlomo, right, and outlines the punishment. We see a lot of enemies, already conflicts that are breaking up. Shlomo dies, and finally, in New Bet, we have the split of the kingdom between Yerobam and Rehavam, right, the ripping of the kingdom in half. Um, and that basically is like, um, leading to the rebellion of the, and the split of the ten northern tribes. So that basically, in summary, is basically all of Sipur Rei Shlomo, um, the beginning of Malach Um What I wanted to focus on here, just to give us something to think about, um, is a couple of questions. And we see here where we're going to see different Bible scholars have different opinions. Um, I'm curious to think what, what, what you think as a group. The first is basically going to be, where is the highlight here of Shlomo HaMel? So um, the major kind of, um, kind of Bible scholars that I, that are, or Tanakh scholars that I, I've read about this topic is Rabbi Alex Yisrael and Rabbi Nachal Nitek. So kind of a, a debate a little bit between them. They have different perspectives. But one thing to think about is what was the highlight of Shlomo's kingdom? So on one hand, you could look at this and say that it seems that perhaps the highlight really is the construction of the Beit HaMikdash, right? Um, or was the highlight, that's more Rabbi Alex Israel, and, and Rabbi Levtag says no, and we'll see why this might be a little bit more harder to prove, that really the highlight is down here of the visit of Malkash Shavah. That really when non-Jews are coming to the Beit HaMikdash and coming to Shlomo and recognizing 
like the kingdom of God as being a kingdom of Tzedek and Mishpat, that really is the highlight. So let's, we're going to kind of see what questions where is the highlight. My question for you, which I think is a little more important here, is where is the downfall? If you had to kind of draw a line, and I, I left this kind of open-ended, right, because where exactly it starts, if you had to draw a line on the chart, if you look at it, you can see the whole thing right on the first page, where do you think the decline starts? Where does Shlomo's kingdom start to fall apart? Like if you had to draw kind of like a line across a certain point. So any, any thoughts? Yeah, I think when he institutes the corvée, that's early on, to do, to collecting the um, materials of the temple from... Uh, Interesting. So you're saying kind of earlier on, when, when, the, tax, on. when the taxation starts and the, yeah. the labor force. So even kind of like before the Beit Dash is outlined, like even then, that's kind of the beginning the beginning of the end for you. Yes, I think so. Okay. Other thoughts? Anyone have other thoughts? Where do you, if you had to draw a line, where do you think, like, is it, again, going back to that parallel of very good and very bad, where would you draw a line? Where does the downfall kind of begin? What do you think? Well, yeah. Mourns him. Okay. So interesting. So we have over here, this is kind of like paratet, you would say, like around. So that is kind of what Rabbi Alex Israel says. It's interesting here if we want to parallel it, we have. I actually don't want to write it like this. It, it won't actually come up. We move it, but on one hand, we're told in Paratet that God appears to Shlomo, right over here. But God already appeared to Shlomo where? Earlier, right, right at the beginning, in Kibot. So it's kind of a nice kind of structure, like here God appears and everything's good, right? And then building down in Paratet, God appears now, but what's the message now? Everything, it's like the warning. Like Shlomo, you know, things are kind of, you know, you have to be careful with your influence. Um, and God basically tells him. It's not so much a, a criticism, but more of like an implied warning that, you know, just know that my protection, my taking care of you is dependent, and your success is dependent on your behavior. Which again, you usually don't give a warning like that unless something had been happening before, right? So here also, perhaps here's the decline, right, where, where it happens over here. Does anyone want to give another another line, like what might be a, another option of like where, the, where Shlomo's kingdom might go into decline? Yeah? Because he's not when he built the palace for himself, it also shows that uh, was the thing was the grandeur that he or the stature that he attained, you know, was getting to him a little bit. For sure, right over here, kind of right, even though it's framed within this context of the base Mikdash, on a closer look, this whole idea of constructing the palace, like where are Shlomo's priorities, right? Seems to be a question that's being asked. Perhaps that what is that what ends up inviting this kind of you know chat from Hashem about what exactly are your priorities. Um, what's interesting also to kind of bring all this together, um, Rabbi Alex Israel, he tries to develop kind of similar to, to what you said, that you know really we have the parallels of God appearing to Shlomo earlier and God appearing to Shlomo over here, and the decline really starts with Paratech. Um, Rabbi Levtag disagrees a little bit. Um, I spent this past summer learning at Matan, and I had a chance to, to ask Rabbi Levtag about this. He still, he still very much believes that, that Malkat Shva, the visit of Malkat Shva is kind of so powerful, is, is such the highlight of kind of everything we're supposed to be doing as a kingdom revolving around Sadiq and Mishpat, that you can't have anything negative before that, even though obviously there are, there are cracks, you know, in Shlomo's kingdom, but the actual downfall really comes explicitly, explicitly with Perakid off, which we're going to see actually does, this is when it explicitly says Shlomo did bad things, or Shlomo sinned, and that really thinks, this is basically the highlight, and then over here is when there's a downfall, or Rabbi Alex Israel tries to say a little bit earlier, no, really, it's paratet, and this, even though Malkat Shra is good, you know, we'll, we'll try to give that a grade when we analyze it together, but there's still a lot of power, wealth, and wisdom. If we actually compare it, you know, over here, we have God appears to Shlomo, and then we have, in Parakei, power, wealth, and wisdom. If we want to kind of show, like, an envelope structure, and we have power, wealth, and wisdom, international relations, forced labor, um, which, again, could be bad, but also sometimes you do need to have certain people um, helping you out. Hang on one, one second. But then when we look over here on Paratet, we also have power, wealth, and wisdom, but now things are kind of falling apart. That there's power, wealth, and wisdom, but what we're going to see is when people come to hear his wisdom, they also kind of have to make a donation. And there's negotiations with Hiram that things aren't going so well. Hiram basically comes to Shlomo and says, I thought we made a deal and, and you owe me a little bit more money. And they have to kind of like negotiate, renegotiate the contract a little bit. Which also begs the question of, you know, when you're building up your kingdom, sometimes you want to make sure you're not going into the red, right, and, and where that money's going to come from. And then we have a lot of kind of gold and horses and accumulation, which the question I think that's going to be one of the major themes we're going to develop here is affluence in general is not seen as a negative thing, right, but how is that affluence used? I think the question here is when that affluence is not to, to bring people to see the splendor of the Beit HaMikdash, 
but it's more kind of, you know, accumulation of gold and silver. And what, again, Malkat Shabbat could be the highlight, you know, but at the same time, why is Malkat Shabbat coming? Is she coming because of the Tzedek and the Mishpat, or is she also coming because of the gold and the riches, and, and where is the apple and still being used in a positive way or not? And I think one of the themes we'll see is, in general, I think we know this, right, from, from our own communities, that if you want people to take you seriously, like if you want, if an office building or a law firm wants to be taken seriously, you have to have a nice lobby, right? You have to have certain things or a school, right? You have to have a, a school dinner and you have to make sure everything looks respectful and that the offices have money put into them. But at the same time, you know, that's how you get people to take your value seriously. But there's always that fine line, right? At what point does, you know, the affluence and the investment also take a personal element? And that's something I think we'll see here with some So I saw a couple of hands, yeah. Uh, you have power, wealth, and wisdom listed as if they are they are equal in the text, but I don't think they are. Okay. If you read the text, um, though he's, there's only really one example given of his wisdom, and that was with the, the story of the two prostitutes. Good, yeah, we'll talk about that soon. Otherwise, the text says, well, he was wise, and he was wise, and he was wise, but doesn't give any examples. Um, a lot of the text is devoted to his wealth. I think the major amount is devoted to his wealth. Um, somewhat less than his power. Um, and, and, and I asked my question, if he was so wise in the end, why did his kingdom end up the way it is? Maybe. Good question. And that's, I think, something that, that, that's really our job today, right? To yeah. figure out, you know, what is happening. And, and again, like, wealth is necessary, right? If you want people to take the Beit seriously, this has to be, you know, but a nice, nice place. But not just was his palace, for sure. the palace the door. But, but I would extend that, that it's not just the Beit Midrash, but Yerushalayim itself. You know, you yeah. want the city, you want the city to look fancy. Like, it should be a nice, it should be five-star hotels, or people should want to come to Yerushalayim. But at the same time, when is that like almost a, a you know it's a dangerous path a little bit to, to navigate and that and excellent so that's kind and, of and also I don't think he should get credit for the empire it was really David who did the conquering good point, good point uh, also. Solomon Solomon held on to it right but he his reign was peaceful he didn't really he didn't have to go to war right no no for sure so these are all great points so I think what we're going to do now now that we just saw this general overview right and we kind of saw that it's a little bit murky right where exactly is the downfall is it over here, when God appears to him, is it only when there's like a direct sin? Um, how exactly are we supposed to kind of view these different these different steps? So that's what we're going to do now. Um, so what I want to show one more thing about the stark difference between Perak Gimel and Perak Gidal, and then we'll have a chance to go through the stories and try to give Shlomo a grade. So if you look on um, the second page, and that's chart over here, so this is adapted from Dr. Micha Goodman, um, who is a, deals with a lot of kind of um, Jewish philosophy, different institutes in Israel. Um, so he has a book written actually about Sefer Dvarim, but in it he talks a lot about leadership, and he mentions Shlomo. And he gives just a great parak where he shows kind of the differences between Perak Gimel and Perak Gidal, and how the language is really trying to show, going back to our original question, almost Per Gimel being congratulatory, look how great things are, and Per Gimel showing really the stark difference. And just to show kind of some of the textual textual differences that go back and forth, in Per Gimel we are told that Shlomo loves Hashem, that Shlomo loves God. Um, right, it says, right, we know, even though it says Be'yachach at Bat Paro, that he gets married to Bat Paro, it says in Pasuk Gimel, Be'yachach Shlomo et Hashem, Alecha Bechukot David Aviv, um, that he loves um, God. But then in Parakidal, we have almost the same language, but there's a switch. Right now we say, That like his the language of his love for God has now been transferred. Something happened between Paragimal and Paragidal that now his love for God is turned to his love for foreign women. Um, and if you skip down to the second thing, what's interesting is the other theme in Paragimal is that even though the temple has not been built, people are worshiping at Bamot. Bamot were kind of like Shtiblach, basically. It was like little <laughs> little um, places where people who didn't want to travel part of the Beit HaMikdash would offer Korban notes. Um, and this was fine until the Beit HaMikdash was, it wasn't ideal, but it was, wasn't was outlawed until the Beit HaMikdash was built. And we're told, right, Ad Kalo told the notes of Beit HaMikdash, Beit HaShem, and tell right, he built his own palace and the Beit HaMikdash, um, right, Yerushalayim, et cetera, et cetera, and Parag Bet, sorry, Pasuk Bet, Rak Ha'am Mizbachim B'Bamot, Kilo Nibneh Ba'ik L'Shem. Right, that point, people were worshiping on the Bamot, like that's fine, um, not really problematic. But when we look at Parakid Olaf, it kind of twists it a little bit. And what has happened? As Yibnei Shlomo Bama, the Chmo Shiketz Moav, Bahar Asher Al Pnei Yushalayim, Ula Molach Shiketz Pnei Amon. Now he's building. Even though Bamot we said before are not so problematic because they were for God. By Parakid Olaf, those Bamot are being built for who? For Avodah Zarah, right? For idolatry. So again, we see this kind of stark difference between Parakid Gimel and Parakid Olaf. And our original question 
right? Two questions, really. One is what happens? Is this concurrence, basically? Or is there some incidence that, that switches slow over from like the good side to the dark side? Um, and finally, this overwhelming in sense of, of, inf of affluence that we've, we've kind of picked up on and how exactly affluence should be harnessed or affluence um, should be used productively. Okay, so if we turn the page over, oh, finally, this is the last thing I wanted to show. I think what's ironic about Parag a little bit is that the sins that Shlomo ends up doing, right, the amassing of, of wealth, of gold, of horses, of foreign wives, is exactly what you were warned not to do where, right, in, right, it's very Parshat Hamela, that we're told explicitly if you want a Jewish king, which itself is debatable if that's ideal or not, right, if you want a Jewish king in Parshat Hamela, in, in um, Saber Dvarim, we're told, lo yerbelo nashim, lo yasrlo babo, vekesef asahab, lo yerbelo maod, Right? And Shlomo's sin list is basically a checklist of exactly what you're not supposed to do. Um, so again, just to kind of see also, like, where does this come from, like the sense of hubris or the sense of, you know, that, that leads to this downfall. Okay, so we've, we've raised a lot of issues. So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of go through some of the major stories and try to give Shlomo a grade, pass or fail, if these things are really 100% good. Like, is there really some giant switch that happens either in Paragtet or in Paragudalip, or for sure by Paragudalip? Or are the earlier stories themselves somewhat problematic? And then we'll see if we can come up with some answers. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was his marriage to Bat Paro. So this is source number four. Um, his marriage to Bat Paro, um, was it something that was good? Was it something that was bad? Um, so any thoughts as to that? What do you, we had to grade Shlomo on this marrying Bat Paro, good? Or, well, I think, I think we all understand like the bad of these, right? We can see like why, why, you know, marrying someone who's not from, you know, foreign, foreign national might be seen as, as problematic, especially someone from Paro. Um, sorry, someone, right, someone descended from, from Paro. Uh, but is there any justification we could give for this, right? Is this a, an X on Shlomo? Is this a check? Thoughts about, about this? Yeah. Um, it seems to me it's a political marriage. I mean, Egypt was obviously one of the major powers of the time. Sure. And Shlomo thought politically, at least part of the time, mm -hmm. and so to secure a good relationship. 100%, and I think that is one, one main reason. It actually, of all the things about Shlomo, this actually bothers me the least, but I think this was yeah. understandable, that you have a mandate as the king of, uh, you know, it's interesting because I think we see Melachim as supposed to, as in Tanakh, especially when you, I, I think learning it myself, you know, growing up in school as religious figures. But really, there were political leaders who were charged with how can I take care of the country in the best way that I know how. And people come next week, we'll talk about Acha. I think it's a very similar kind of situation. And one way to ensure that your kingdom was going to be prosperous, right, and your kingdom would be taken care of, is to have political marriages. And what we'll see, I think, at the end, Dr. Micha Goodman brings this up, is that David kind of, try, and if we think about it, right, Eretz Israel is kind of in this in this place right in the middle. Like I gave you the map at the, at the end, right, right on the, on the Via Maris, on the King's Highway linking major kingdoms, right? So look at the map right over here, right? That like Eretz Yisrael is like prime, prime real estate for any major empire to want to conquer. So how does David protect his people? He fights wars all the time. He tries to show that you don't call, if you come into Eretz Yisrael, you have to, you're going to be messing with me. You might not want to do that. Shlomo takes a very different approach. What's the best way to ensure peace and prosperity in your borders? Right? Create political marriages with the, with the person below, with Egypt. And with Sidon, make a financial contract, right? And that's a, that's a good way to protect your people. So I think on one end, even though we could debate, right, religiously, you know, it was just the best idea, because Bat Haro is the one who ends up bringing perhaps a lot of the Abu Zarah um, later on. At the same time, you know, this wasn't Shlomo's idea as a young king. What is the best way to take care of your kingdom? Make a political marriage. Um, so again, I think this is something that, you know, we could leave as, you know, maybe problematic, but at the same time, understandable. It's interesting in Source 5, the Gemara and Shabbat actually sees it as no, even though the story of Bat Paro is actually the first one we have in our chart over here. The Gemara and Shabbat says this was the beginning of the downfall. It's interesting. You read, draw the line kind of here. And it says, but Haten Shlomo Paro Bel, oh, sorry, wrong source, source number five. Our Rabbi Huda Amar Shmuel, B'Sha'ash and Asa Shlomo Bat Paro, Yerav Gabriel, V'Na'at Kanye Bayam. And um, the Gemara says basically that when Shlomo married about Paro and Gabriel, the angel, right, came down, struck a reed in the sea, and this became, out of this grew the kingdom of Rome. So obviously this is, you know, metaphorical, but the idea here being that the ultimate destruction or the ultimate korban, right, has its seeds where? All the way here with this choice of Shlomo to kind of bring foreign influence, even if we could say it's justified, this idea of bringing foreign influence in, already kind of started a chain of events that would lead Shlomo and the kingdom of, uh, of Israel down a dark path. 
personally, I'm not sure. I, I do think the political thing is, you know, you're supposed to do hishtaglut. You're supposed to do what you think is best for your country. I think Shlomo was trying to do what's best for his country. But again, interesting is to see, right, the reason of Chazal would also, I think, an understanding that we have for for wanting to help your country through political political matters, which is what people did, right, uh, back in that day. Yes? So where does Ruach HaKodesh come in here? Like, you have Shlomo, who is a tzaddik, who is a yeah. great person, and Hashem doesn't tell him to do this. He doesn't consult with Hashem either. He just says, I'm going to do it. So it's Kofi, the Oats, and the But he was such a great person. How, For sure. How did this come about? What, what little switch? So, yeah, I, I think that's an excellent... in his mind that he... Right. So it's interesting. I think that at the same time that Shlomo was someone with Ruch HaKodesh, but I think there's always that sense of Hishtalut, right, of taking initiative... Yeah, Right, and, and I think it's coming Free from a good home. place, right? Of, of he has his mandate, not just from the people, but from God to protect his people. And, you know, making a decision that he thinks, you know, that I think is going to be something that will help Am Yisrael, that will protect them, that he won't, you know, I, I don't know if it takes away from the religion. And there are Mepharshim who say also that, by, you know, about Kavar converted, you know, and, he, and you, can, you can read it in line, I think, of him trying to do something that would help the country, but that wouldn't compromise religious values. But there is always kind of a price, and I think that, Shlomo, while, you know, a tzaddik and a great, great king try to do the best for Am Yisrael, there's always a sense, I think, in Tanakh that we don't shy away, right, from showing, you know, times when our leaders, you know, also, like, make mistakes, you know, and kind of seeing that as a, like, everyone is flawed. And even the greatest leaders in Tanakh, you know, made mistakes, and then the Nabiim wrote that down for us, for us to learn from. But, so, he, he, so inherently, into the Malucha, he should have figured that he's going to go down because every king and kingdom Right. Sure. Well, he is the first one, so I guess. And he saw it from his father, too, and other kingdoms around him. Right, right. No, I, I think that is kind of like, like a big question, like a challenge right, to, to think of here, of how Shimon navigates that as we go through it. Um, but yeah, a great, great point. Um, so that basically is the marriage to Bob Parvo. So I think we can kind of see that, right, as maybe good, maybe bad. Um, the next thing, which is very famous, is Shlomo's request for wisdom, right? We know it's the whole thing in Gibbon. God appears to him and says, what do you want? And Shlomo says, I want to be, I want to be wise, right? He says, uh, just highlighted in source number six, right? Lahavin bein tov v'raf, right? He wants to, he wants to have a, we begin the question, but hatzal adecha leif shomel eshuot damecha, I want to be able to judge the people. Lahavin bein tov v'raf, so the difference between good and bad. Um, and God obviously says, Shlomo, I'm so proud of you. You didn't ask for money, you didn't ask for jewels, you asked for this, I'll give you everything, right? Um, perfect solution for, uh, right, perfect ending for Shlomo. And the next story we're told, right, is the story of the two zonot, the prostitutes who come for justice. This is the main, that story is almost seen as a proof, right, of Shlomo's justice, that he, right, the whole famous story, the sword, I'm going to cut the baby, right, and, and everyone decides that, you know, everyone sees Shlomo's wisdom and is awed by it. Um, in general, when we first think of that story, I think we could think of it as being very positive, right? On one hand, right, Shlomo is not asking for riches. He's specifically asking for um, to be a shofet. He's asking for wisdom, to be a judge, something that's very, um, something in, on one hand that is seen as very positive. Um, at the same time, though, um, could this also be perhaps something a little bit negative? Um, so that's why I want to kind of explore a little bit together. That on one hand, um, even though it's positive, right, he's asking for wisdom, is there perhaps a darker side game? Something that I hadn't thought about before until I read some of these articles that, that talk about this. Any thoughts? What could be kind of a darker side to, like, could we find any problem with Shlomo asking for wisdom, or does this seem to be great, like overall, like a, a pass, or is there perhaps something here that might be a little problematic? Yeah. I think that wisdom and the search for wisdom brings uh, curiosity for different things, inquisitiveness, and that's a path that uh, should be like a trend. Interesting. So, good point. Uh, maybe to, to you know, piggyback off that, it's interesting that right, is wisdom really the best thing to ask for, right? Or could this right lead to a, a problematic path? Um, I want to kind of take that a step further, right? If we really want to think about what the best thing would be to ask for, perhaps it would be Yerashamai, right? Maybe he should be asking for Yerashamai, maybe he should be asking for something else. What's interesting is even with asking to judge, and I think someone mentioned this before, the only time we have an example of Shlomo judging anything and his whole Sipurim and this whole story is really only the story of the Zonot, which is interesting. Um, a couple of things that different, different um, scholars point out, different Tanakh scholars in, in uh, Megadim, right, in Tanakh periodicals point out, some of the articles listen, listen to the back, if we think about the language, Shlomo was asking, Lehavin bein tovu l'ra. What other story does that remind us of? Lehavin bein tovu l'ra. Adana Chava, right? Like asking to the knowledge of good and evil, it's not really seen as a good thing, right, in, in, in uh, Parshat Bereshit. Um, so even here, right, wisdom, at first we're like, oh, wisdom's awesome. And then we're like, we think about it for a second, wait a second. He didn't ask for your Shemayim. 
Um, Tovel Ara seems almost like there, it's asking us as the readers of Tanakh to look at that story of Bereshit and be conscious of that story of Bereshit. Uh, what's fascinating also is I think it's something that, that the Midrash picks up on as well. So if you look at source number seven in Shira Shirim, because um, a Midrash actually paints this request of Shlomo in a, in a little bit of a negative light, which is something that personally for me I hadn't really seen before and I hadn't thought before, so we'll read it together. Um, it says, Rosimon Beshem Rabbi Shimon Mechalachta Levilotu Shahaya Gadel Beto Shalmel. There was an orphan who grew up in the palace of the king. It's telling us a story here. Amar Leh Hamelech. Um, and the king asks him, you know, he's like his adopted foster son, let me know what I can give you. Like if I ask for money and jewels, the king will give me money and jewels. If I ask for the king's daughter, then what? I'll get everything. I, remember, it's like the, I always remember as a kid, like the story of the you know, genie comes and offers you three wishes, and we used to say, you know, like, really, what should be your first wish? You ask for more wishes. You know, that's how you. So it's almost here. It's saying that, like, when Shlomo, me, as well, just the end of it, right, says that also with Shlomo, Amar Shlomo, Imeshal Kesef Sahaba Avanim Tobot Margulio to no tenli. If I ask God for riches, he'll give that to me. Ella, Harea Nishoel, and Hachochma, Bakol Bechla. And what's interesting here is it's, this is really the Midrash doing it, right? Which we think would paint Shlomo in a, in a positive way. The Midrash is basically saying that Shlomo was being a little bit subversive here, right? That like his request for wisdom wasn't this positive Yerachamayim equivalent, but he was thinking, you know, how can I get the, the most out of my request from God? Like this is actually also going to bring me riches, which brought back to our people mentioned, you know, Shlomo's interest in affluence, right? Seeing it over here. And it, even in this Midrash, it's equating Shlomo, Shlomo thinking of himself as asking for the king's daughter, right? He's almost seeing himself as God's son-in-law, and we're going to see how that, that hubris almost seems to come up a little bit. Yeah? Uh, also, I think asking for wisdom is like an egocentric type of thing. It's, um, you know, it, it, it's just to make him greater. For sure, right? I think that's the big question of Shlomo. Everything that he does, like, you need to have a wise leader, you need to have riches to, to run your kingdom properly, but is it really the Shema, right? Like, is it something that he wants to do, or is it, is it coming... Coming across as something else. Yeah. So does the asking of wisdom denote that he already has the wisdom? Also, an interesting point, right? That like even being able to make that request, uh, right? And I think this is something here that we're, we're already seeing. It's a little bit murky. And what I want to point out also is the next story, the story of the two zone notes, right? Which is our proof of Shlomo's great wisdom. So Rabbi Chaim Angel, who's Happy a Happy Mechanech Thursday, for everybody. So he everybody is in the regular rooms except leaves. for this the is, senior for one of seven. 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 Look and how great the group you're moving to 213. Have fun, everybody. The main point of the story of the two zone notes isn't the whole thing of look how smart with his whole plan. You know, like, oh, look, we're going to cut the baby in half and get the real mother to confess. That really the, the, the most powerful part of that story is that in Shlomo's kingdom, even two zone notes, even two prostitutes who are the lowest level of society can come before the king and get justice. And what an amazing society <coughs> rooted in Sedek and Mishpat. I think that's something that's very powerful and very telling about the insertion of that narrative right after Shlomo asked for wisdom. Um, but what's also to, to show the flip side, um, so um, if you look over here in source um, number nine, so Dr. Yoav Marzilai, an article This is Dekal Sahanechad has been moved to room 240. Uh, he this says, is actually, is that, story, room 240. that story of the two zone notes, if you think about it in like a deeper sense, can actually be pretty scary. And then maybe it's not really showing the greatness of Shlomo, but maybe it shows almost a, like he almost makes it sound like a, a megalomaniac, like it, it shows almost a very a negative sign. And to give a sense of almost the source before in, in source eight, right, it says that all of Aishmu Kol Yisrael Tamishpat Asher Shafat Amelach, everyone hears, is right at the end of the story of the Tuzanot, everyone hears the wisdom that Shlomo brought in his verdict, but your room with Nehemela, right, and they're in awe. So one and awe is good, because everyone's saying, you know, oh my gosh, Shlomo our king is so wise, but awe could also mean what? Fear. Like, and I always think of it this way, imagine you were the next person in line to get your case judged after the story of the, of the two zone note, right? So you see everything and you're like, okay, I'm waiting for it. It's like you're waiting for traffic court, right? What happens? Like the king's like, I got this. And he pulls out the sword. He's like, bring me the sword. And if you're standing in line, I feel like I would be like, what? Like, what is happening? You know, and if you got the sword, you know, we're going to cut the baby in half. And that's how we'll decide the winner. So when I we read this as growing up, we're like, oh, this is such a great, like, that's ingenious. You know, how he's going to figure that out. But I wonder if you're standing there, I feel like you would be like, all right, anyone want to go in front of me? Like, <laughs> someone else want to go next? Like, I, I'm good. I want my own justice. So I think also, like, there's, there's this, right, that if we read this story, it, it's a little, it's a it could be a brilliant plan, but that could have very easily backfired, right? And, like, where is this wisdom coming from? And what Dr. Barzi lies, as Professor Barzi lies, what I think is fascinating is he says there's a lot of parallels 
And I think we, this is you know, written by the Navi especially to make us think about it, paralleling the story of the Shtei Zonot and Akidah Yitzchak, which I think is also like a very fascinating thing. So you look at that chart number nine, uh, there's a lot of parallel words, right? It says on the third day, in the morning, right, the, the Zonot realize that the, the, the baby is dead or the baby's alive. There's two of them together, right, that are always going. Um, there's a lot of parallels. There's also the Milah Mancha, right, the, the main word that keeps being repeated over and over again, of Beno or Beni, right, the focus on son, basically in both stories. And thematic parallels, the child is saved from death the last minute by command from a higher power, right, whether it's the angel coming down and stopping or staying on Abraham's hand, or Shlomo being like, just kidding, we weren't really going to do this. Um, the killing the child, quote unquote, test is really a test of the parent's self sacrifice, but there's a happy ending in both. The child is reunited with the parent. However, the main difference, Dr. Bryce Light says, is that an, Abraham's test, which there's, you know, you could give a whole shiur on the ethics of the Akeda, is at least commanded by God. And that's something that people find, you know, already that they have to debate and, and analyze and find somewhat challenging. But the test of Zono was commanded by who? Commanded by Shlomo. Like, who is Shlomo to suddenly, you know, see himself as the giver or taker of the life of a child? So almost framing this as a Kidat Yitzchak, I think, puts Shlomo in a little bit of a different perspective. Is this someone who is using his power, you know, and his, and his tremendous wisdom for good? Or is this already, like, even earlier in the story, kind of showing us kind of like, and I don't think it's necessarily a negative thing, but, you know, a darker side a little bit to Shlomo. So something interesting over here, and just the last two sources on this page, Sources 10 and 11 talk about how people come from all over the land, right? Remember when we call Ha'amim Lishmor Chachmat Shlomo, but at the same time, by the time we get to Perig Yud, when people are coming to hear Shlomo's wisdom in Pasuk HaDalad, Bekol Ha'aretz Mevakshim Ad Pnei Shlomo Lishmor Chachmat right? And read along in the Hebrew and English, right? Everyone is coming to listen um, to Shlomo and hear his wisdom. Pasuk HaPei, Behema Mevi'im Ish Min Chato, like Kesa, Bechle Zahav, Shlomo, Tvenesheit, Vubasamim, Susim, Fredim, Dvar Shana Veshana. Everyone's coming to hear his wisdom, but they're also coming when they hear, to hear the wisdom. What do they have to do? They write a check, right? So again, like how is this? How is this kind of coming together? Like is this lishma shlomo judging everyone for the good of the people, or is this also something that's being used to kind of pay the coffers of the of his building projects and and to me, gosh, you know? But but again, something to think about to frame it in a little bit of a different way. Um, okay, which gets us to our kind of next source, and we'll look at a couple more examples, and we'll have a chance to wrap this up. Um, building projects. So I think we spoke a little bit about this before. Um, we see this in source 12, that we're told that, um, first we're told about Shlomo building his own palace, and it says by Ibnayu Sheva Shanim, that it takes him, sorry, I'm, sorry, it talks about here at first of the Beit HaMikdash, right? So it talks about, um, finally the Beit HaMikdash is finished with all of its specifications by Ibnayu Sheva Shanim. So it takes him seven years to build the Beit HaMikdash, and right after it says, that Beit now Shlomo Shlos Shreshanam. But to build his own palace, it takes what? It takes 13 years. So it's interesting here to think about, and the Mepharshim played both ways, right? Angel talks about this a little bit, that on one hand you could say that maybe he's focusing on his own, um, uh, maybe he's focusing at least the base of Dash, he did what? He did that first. So he's prioritizing that. So maybe it's a positive thing. He's putting the base of Dash first. But at the same time, even though we built it first, just if we think about the time, the time lapse, right, that, that he is spending a lot more effort on his own building. So where exactly are his priorities? So there are different Mepharshim who say no, that like with his own his own building, he was like lazy, and it took him 13 years because he was really lazy. But with the Beit HaMikdash, he was, you know, the reason my team was a like people want to be quick to do mitzvot, so he did it shorter because he was like, let's let's do this. That's one way to spin it, right? Or you could spin it right a little bit of a different way than the shot and say no, right? He did something first, but he kind of didn't spend as much effort, even though seven years is a tremendous amount of time. But for his own palace, you know, for that, he's going to invest. So again, already, I think this goes back to... Um, what we see over here, right, which people mentioned already at the beginning, the palace kind of being the focus here, um, even though he's still building the Beit HaMikdash. If you look at Source 13, just talking about size, there's a tremendous amount of Herod Bob and Herod Zion that talk about the, the size, right, and just the dimensions of the royal buildings vis-a-vis -vis the temple um, is also very stark. Right? The, his buildings are much bigger, much grander than the Beit HaMikdash. Um, Rabbi um, Alex Israel talks about this also, that the fact that Shalom puts his palace right next to the Beit HaMikdash, is that because he wants to kind of extend the kiddusha, the holiness of the Beit HaMikdash to his own palace, where there's also an element of legitimacy and control, you know, that his his power comes from being linked, you know, to the Beit HaMikdash, and how is he harnessing harnessing that power. However, and I think this is something that is very positive, you look in Source 14, um, when there's a great dedication ceremony right over here of the Beit HaMikdash, Shlomo gives a very, very powerful tefillah, which he almost outlines the mission statement of why he created the Beit HaMikdash, right, where he says that, um, 
right? Ki Shmeun at Shimcha Gadola. People will come from all over, um, not just from from Jews, not just from Israel. People will come from all over the land, right, to recognize God's name, right? Recognize God's name and pay homage to God in the Beit Hamikdash. Leman Yitun Kol Yemei Haaretz at Shimcha Liyuratcha Ki Amcha Israel. Right, and that everyone will know your name and revere you. This will be the ultimate kind of Kiddush Hashem, the ultimate kind of headquarters. See, you know, like like giant building headquarters of God's presence on earth. And I think that to, to I know we've been a little rough on Shlomo, but I think to, to defend Shlomo here, I think something that's, that's very very meaningful. And this goes back to our question of Shlomo. Shlomo, I think, is a CEO. He's someone who is thinking carefully about how can we make Yerushalayim and how can we how can we make Yerushalayim great again? Right? How can we make Yerushalayim the Beit Hamikdash this this focus where everyone comes to worship God, which is really what our our objective is, right? To to have to be a, a chosen people placed, right? We talk about the the king's hierarchy, right? placed in a section of land that's between two giant empires, right? Of Egypt and Mesopotamia. Like we're supposed to be the Orla Goyim, and the best way to do this is to make our capital city the capital city. This is, should be the number one tourist destination. You know, this should be the place where everyone wants to come. Um, this should be the place that, that everyone is focused on. Um, a few weeks ago, near Barkach, the, the mayor of Jerusalem, he came, he spoke at Yeshiva University, and they invited um, different schools to send students. So I took some students from my own, and we had a chance to go and, and hear him speak. Um, and he spoke a lot about that, how he was a businessman, um, and he you know, left the private sector to become the mayor of Jerusalem to basically build it up, because he saw kind of all these issues, and he wanted to build it up to be kind of, he, I remember one of the lines, he was, and the you know, students were asking great questions, and one of the an questions that he answered, you know, is what his goals were. Can you let Ava come to the front office? You know, sure. line, the number one tourist destination. Like, everyone should be coming to Jerusalem. Like, that should be, like, the main tourist destination here. So I think also, coming from a very good place, Shlomo wants everyone to be coming to Beit HaMikdash to worship, to worship God. But the question is, does that affluence come, you know, a little bit at a cost? Um, we're running out of time, so I just want to share one more thing so we can kind of bring this together. Um, oh, and I'll share, share one source over here also. In, in, in Source 15, the Gemara and Shabbat kind of tells like, the whole story over here, just again, I think, showing how does Shlomo really see himself. It uses the Mizmor of Tehillim that we say, uh, right, that Shlomo came before the Beit HaMikdash, and he wanted to open the door. So he started saying, you know, these lines, that lift up your head. Uh, gates, right? Open your doors, right? By Yavo Melcha Kavod, and let the Melcha Kavod come in. And the gates actually, you know, become animated, right? It's like Beauty and the Beast here, and they, they take on their own life themselves, and they sell, and they don't want to let him in. And they ask him, Mimza Melcha Kavod, right? So working the Sukim back in, almost because, wait a second, Shlomo, do you mean God? Because based on your you know, track history, there's a very good chance that when you say Melcha Kavod, who do you mean? You, you mean yourself, right? right? There's almost this whole debate of, of how, again, we see the Gemara, Gemara and the Bidrash is also coming to see us about Shlomo that, you know, then he's like, no, 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 you know, really, it's God I'm talking about, and they let him in. But this whole kind of sense also of how exactly we view Shlomo is viewed. All right, the last thing I want to share um, is taxation. And we'll kind of wrap this up kind of together, I think this is important. Um, taxation in general, if we look through, and I think we saw this in the chart, there's a lot of different times where there's forced labor or taxation that comes in. Um, and Raviol bin Nun, kind of, there's like three basic, three basic examples of taxation. So in Source 16, we're told that when Shlomo wants to build the Beit HaMikdash, his own house at Beito, and something called the Milo. The Milo was basically the area between kind of where Bat Paro lived and where Shlomo's palace was that he kind of filled in. So it was kind of seen as an extension more for Bat Paro than it was really for the temple or for anything else. He needed basically people to help him. So it talks about also when he wants to build up his Aramis Kanot, Whereas garrison towns. What's interesting is we actually have a lot of archaeological evidence of the, those major cities of, um, um, of, of Megiddo and Hazor and Gezer, which they've been excavating like in the past few years, but they found a lot of stuff from the time period of Shlomo. Um, so Arabia's Kanot already don't remind us of what? Uh, the, the ex the right, Jews right. And say Kashmot, right? The Arabia's Kanot are like the cities that the, the Jews as slaves are building, so that'll be important in a, in a minute. Um, and we're giving kind of different examples of taxation. So the first one over here it says, by Yalem Shlomo Lamas Oved, that Shlomo makes a forced labor, um, a forced labor force, but it's from non-Jews that are around there. It says clearly, Yisrael Lo Natan Shlomo Eved. And the first thing is basically Shlomo is taking non-Jews for forced labor, but he's not taking Jews. Fast forward to source 17. Now it says that Shlomo actually does take Jews, but it's more like a workforce, and you have two months on, one month off, right? By Yalem Shlomo Mas Bikol Yisrael Biyumas Shloshim El Bish, right? It talks about they would send them up to Lebanon, right? To, to um, Hiram to help kind of cut wood and do different things like that. One, sorry, one month in Lebanon and two months at home. So it is Jews, but it's not, it's forced, forced labor, but you know, you can go home. You get time off, shifts. 
But then finally in source 18, there's something called Sevel Beit Yosef, which seems that specifically people from Beit Yosef, people from the tribe of Binyamin, if you think about it, there's always a little bit of conflict between Yehuda and Yosef, right? Um, and Yehuda is where Shlomo is from, that he's taking the, the threat to his kingdom, right, Binyamin, and making Sevel Beit, uh, Sevel Beit Yosef like a forced labor force from specifically Sheva Binyamin, which basically do not get bricks. And this is something that perhaps leads to Yerobam's um, rebellion, because we're told that actually the person who was in charge of that was Yerobam, who was the person who, who breaks, again, who breaks um, away from Shalom at the end. And Rabbi Alex Israel develops how he makes it sound that I think it's a very interesting theory that it was, you know, the rebellion was also very economic based, right? It was almost like this uprising against the, the affluent masses, the socialist, socialist uprising of, yeah. you know, people upset that they're being taken over. Um, and what Rabbi Yol Ben Nun, who's another Tanakh scholar in Israel, what he kind of explains was there were three shifts, basically, in, in the taxation that were happening. Um, and he explains, basically, that on one hand, at the very beginning, um, at the very beginning, to build a temple, Shlomo only, only used non-Jewish lakes. Um, but as things kind of developed, and he needed to extend his building projects to Megiddo, to Chazer, to, all of, to, to Gezer, to all of his garrison towns, to everything like that, he now needs more people. So now he takes Jews, but he gives them, you know, one month at work and two months off. But later, when he has to build a Milo and really expand his building projects, but it seems fundamentally really for Bad Paro, then he creates a real slave force from Beit Yosef. But this actually leads to um, the rebellion, because people might have been okay with working for the Beit Midat, but they're not okay for what, right? Building projects for Bob Haro. Like this is like, at what point does this go from being nationalistic to being personal? So that's one thing I think that we see with the, with the, with the forced labor, that even though it's necessary, and maybe you could argue it, does it get a little bit out of hand, and does this lead to the ultimate rebellion? Which I think one way to, to, to see it also is that the rebellion is something that God says is going to happen, right? It's the punishment. But at the same time, there's always the religious reason that's given, but there's also the practical reason. The practical reason could be because it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, because of Shalom's hubris and a little bit of, of the affluence, it led to people basically breaking away, right? It led to people wanting to kind of rebel a little bit and not be under Shlomo's, Shlomo's thumb when it comes to the tremendous building projects. And this, again, I think comes back to what we said earlier of kind of like seeing these different sides. Um, of Shlomo. Um, yeah, and then we'll wrap up. Wouldn't another um, example of, of taxation be this division of the country into 12 areas, each area yes. was supposed to... Yes, I should cut that because of time, but... Yeah. but and one, since he lived so lavishly, yeah. supporting the royal household probably was... So, so right, Rabbi Alex Israel develops that in his book, and, and so basically before this, we know Shvatim were divided by tribes. And Shlomo actually the redistricts everything, right? Yeah. He redistricts into 12 sections that are not by Shvatim, right? Very early, very early on um, over here. Rabbi Alex Israel says that that was maybe for two reasons. One, exactly as you're saying, like, it actually gets more money. What's interesting, if you look at the shot, it actually seems that Yehuda, Shevi Yehuda, um, gets kind of left out of the taxation, which a lot of people could say is, so Mepharshim kind of like twists to say, no, 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 like, even though it says they were left out, they must have obviously paid taxes. Or you can read it as no, it's a little bit of nepotism here, right? Shlomo's own Shevet gets, ta gets tax breaks, right? Well, everyone else has to pay. Um, and another thing also is by redivisioning it, if you look in Rabbi Alex Israel's book about Sefer Melachim, he shows that it actually really cuts the power of Beit Yosef. And a lot of what Shlomo was doing was political, that Beit Yosef is really the rival here. Um, and how do we kind of control them? Let's stop going by tribes, but now we're going to divide them up by sections. But it also, in a positive way, it could be like, we're not going to have tribal competition anymore. We're one country, and everyone's together, and we're going to have 12 sections, and we're not going to divide up by Shvatim. It was a way of kind of unifying the nation. That's an interesting, interesting point as well. Okay, to wrap everything up, I think that we saw today a lot of different things about Shlomo. Um, I think that, um, again, this actually wraps up with some of the last sources in 21 and 22 and 23, that Shlomo's rule, right, it talks about something, it's a very positive thing. It talks about Shlomo's rule as being everyone um, sitting peacefully in Pasokei, by Yishev Yehuda, Yishev Lebetzach, Yish Tachat Gafno, the Tachat Tenei Toh, right? Everyone's under their fig tree and their, um, and their um, vine, right? Everyone's relaxing. That is almost word for word from Sefer Micha when it talks about Yemot HaMashiach. So on one hand, this really is seen as like a utopian society. But I think one of the biggest messages of this is that utopian societies are great, right? And, and to get to them, you have to have affluence and you have to have riches and taxation, but is there a cost? Like, the, we have to have something that's toho kabor, right? The inside has to match the outside. And even with um, Malkat Shiva, when the Queen of Shiva comes, right, in, in Source 23, which is kind of such a great thing that she sees the 
Tzadik and Mishpat that Shlomo is doing at the same time, is she really coming for the Tzadik and Mishpat, or is it also the gold and silver, right? I think it's a little bit interesting to kind of see that combination. And I think if we want to kind of bring all this together, I think that there's a couple of conclusions that we could have from this about, again, our original question was, is there one incident that turns Shlomo from good to bad? And I think we can see the answer is, it isn't, there isn't one thing that kind of switched him from good and bad. It's a number of things throughout his kingdom, which a lot of these things are things that are positive, that he's doing for a very positive reason. But there's always this danger, this dark side of what are the things that you're doing that you think are going to help your kingdom? When do they also cross over into the personal, right? And a couple of things to think about here, when we think about sin and punishment, sin and punishment in Tanakh, or Tanakh in general, is not written as a history book, right? It's written as a, it's written theologically. Right? One of the examples I think I, I share with my students once is like, if you want to learn about American history, you can have your American history textbook, or you can go see Hamilton the musical. Right? But those are going to do two very different things. Right? The, the history book is telling you history, and the musical is taking a version of that history to teach you know, important lessons about immigration and immigrants and the power of change, different things like that. So that's more, wow, Dylan, actually, but that's more a little bit like Navi, what's happening here. So what's interesting is that Navi's job is to teach us that when you don't listen to God and you sin, what happens? Bad stuff. So they're going to write, they're going to form the book theologically to look like things are really, really good, and then what happened? Sins. And then after that, things are bad. Because that's really the message of the Navi, and that's the job of the Navi to teach us theologically. It's not a, Tanakh is not a history book. We want to, see it's a history book, we have to take everything out. And, and it talks, Tanakh will reference, right? If you want more info, look at the, the book of, you know, this book of records and kings and things like that. It's not a history book. It's a theological, religious book to, meant to guide us. Um, so even though it's painted in very stark, stark um, differences, that's really a theolog that's really the theological lesson. When the reality we saw is much more complex. And the reality really is um, that on one hand, you know, Shlomo was trying to do things that were good, but the, the influence and, and you know, the, the affluence and, and you know, the building project and taxation perhaps got, got away from him. And I think that people are complex personalities. And I think we see that you know, Shlomo was trying to do things in the right way. But each of those things as we went through, whether it's his wisdom, whether it's you know, the taxation, whether it's the building project, they came a little bit with a darker side. Um, and I think that, right, this practical reason of, of being sucked into affluence is also something to think about. And what's interesting is even though the sin that's being listed in Parak Yudal is Avodah Zarah, um, Dr. Micha Goodman talks about this. In general, Avodah Zarah, especially in the Bim um, Achronim, and Yeshayahu, when it talks about Avodah Zarah, Avodah Zarah doesn't, or Elif talks about this a lot also, Avodah Zarah doesn't always mean bowing down to like a clay idol. Avodah Zarah means that you're putting something else over your worship of God. And that could really also be affluence, right? It also could be riches. And I think that even though practically, were his wives, you know, sacrificing other gods? Yeah, like that was happening. But the sin of Avodah Zarah could be extended perhaps to be Shlomo not knowing how to toe that line, you know, between trying to make Am Yisrael like the center of the world, right? And, and making it, you know, five-star Yerushalayim hotels and everyone's coming to worship God like his tefillah, like that's his mission statement. There's a danger in that, right? That's one position you can take, but there's definitely a danger that comes in that, um, right? And I think also that comes with the, the final lesson I'll share is I think within that challenge of, of affluence, it's really important for Yerushalayim to be built up. We said law firms need to have fancy lobbies, right? Schools need to have dinners. Like everything has to kind of fit together. Um, but at the same time, um, there has to be behind all the shininess and the gold and the importance, there has to be substance. Um, I remember reading an article about the Olympics that was talking about kind of like all the human rights violations that were going in. It's like the Olympics have to be this huge thing, but there were all these people that were, you know, dying, like building a lot of the places and the terrible conditions. And I think that that important level of the Shlomo being paralleled to, um, Shlomo being paralleled to Paro, right? And we spoke a little bit about that. I don't know if we mentioned explicitly, but right, the Arabis Kanot, right? The idea of a Bat Paro also, right? Bat Paro is good in Shmot, but here she's bad, right? Um, more or less. Um, and Shlomo has basically become the modern day Paro. And I think that's a really, kind of important message of it's important to have shyness and importance in gold and silver, but what's the cost? Um, so yeah, I think the message for us, right, for Simon Hazaz, is how do we kind of take, you know, when we try to run our own organizations, or if we want to use, you know, wisdom and, and influence from other nations and, and affluence to, to build our things up to serve God. But there's always kind of that, that fine line. I think Shlomo here is more of a, a cautionary tale that, you know, his kingdom ends in failure, but I think a lot of it, he was trying to come to it from, from a good place, but it's important to think about the mistakes he made, even if they were coming from a, you know, a, a really wanting the best for Am Yisrael, and how we can learn from those mistakes in our, in our own society today. Thank you so much, and have a good day.